they don't. Hello everyone and welcome to the second Lowell Parking Study Community Meeting. We are going to allow a few extra minutes for people to join and we will get started soon. Thank you for your patience. Hello everyone and welcome to the second Lowell Parking Study Community Meeting. My name is Christine McCall. I'm the Assistant City Manager and DPD Director. This is our second community meeting on the study and tonight our consultant team will be sharing the study results and recommendations. Next slide. Tonight's agenda will include an introduction of the project team and technical details of the Zoom platform, an overview of the study goals as well as the public outreach efforts and feedback to date, the study findings, draft recommendations, and next steps. We will conclude the meeting with a question and answer session. Next slide, please. I would like to remind everyone of the rules for participating in this meeting, as well as remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded. We have interpreters who are translating the meeting tonight into Spanish, Portuguese, and Khmer. If you require these services, please click the interpretation button on your screen, it's the globe icon, and select which language you wish to hear. At this moment, I will ask all English speakers to please select English as their chosen language. This will allow you to hear translated non-English comments during the Q&A. Next slide. You can view closed captions by clicking the closed captions feature and selecting from the options shown. Show subtitle will display a caption at the bottom of the screen. Full view transcript will display the meeting's audio transcription in a window to the right. Next slide. You may use the chat button to submit a typed question or comment at any point during the meeting. We will be monitoring the chat during the presentation, but ask that you hold substantive comments and questions for the breakout discussion that we will be having later in the meeting. If you have a technical problem or a clarification question about what is being presented, please share your issue in the chat feature at any point during the meeting and we will respond as quickly as possible. I'll note that all project team staff members are listed with staff next to their names in the participant list. A reminder to everyone that the chat is visible to everyone and we encourage you to keep any comments in the chat respectful to others. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to myself, I'm pleased to welcome Terry Ryan, the Parking Director for the City of Lowell. Our consultant team here tonight consists of Stan Tech Consulting and Regina Villa Associates. I'd also like to introduce Michael Clark from the consulting firm Stan Tech, who will provide more detail about the study results and draft recommendations. Next slide. Great. Thank you, Christine. So before we begin the presentation, we want to get a sense of your experience with the Lowell Parking Study to date. So we're going to launch a poll question. Amanda, if you don't mind launching that. And you can answer all that apply. Uh, options are, this is the first time I've heard about the study. I received project emails. I took the parking survey. I attended one of the virtual meetings in February and I attended multiple virtual meetings in February. We'll leave this up for another moment or two. And why don't we close the poll and share the results? So we know here that um, about 40% of participants attended one of the virtual meetings in February, and about half of those attended more than one. Um, but 10 of the 16 respondents uh, took the parking survey. So 
Um, it seems like we have some level of familiarity in our audience tonight with the work that's been conducted to great, uh, conducted to date. So I'm going to stop sharing results. And if we can move on to the next slide, please. Next slide. So the next few slides will walk through the study's goals as well as public outreach efforts which have been conducted for the Perkins study. Next slide. Our citywide study area, um, we are conducting an evaluation of the Perkins system on a citywide basis, but we do wanna stress that data collection that has been conducted for the study was carried out in sub-districts sub shown by the orange boxes in the map to the left. So that includes the entirety of downtown, as well as parts or the entirety of Acre, Back Central, Centerville, Lower Belvedere, Lower Highlands, and Pawtucketville. We've also conducted a, a more of a streamlines evaluation of commercial corridors along Bridge Street, Middlesex Street, and Rogers Street. The findings and the recommendations we're discussing tonight do deal with the city as a whole. So we do want to emphasize the study is not just focused on these orange areas. They are focused on the city as a whole. Next slide, please. So we have eight goals for the study area. This content was shared back at our community meetings back in February, but we'd like to familiarize everybody with our goals once again. Our first goal was to align parking standards with economic development goals of the city. This means to lower development costs, create affordable housing opportunities, increase foot traffic for merchants, and enable use of alternative transportation options. These are all items that can be achieved through smarter parking policy in communities. Next slide. Our next goal was to improve the parking experience. This includes improved wayfinding to parking facilities and from parking facilities to destinations in Lowell, easier payment, greater safety, and customer convenience. Next slide. Another goal of ours was to update the parking system to reflect other citywide goals. This can include multimodal safety, such as some of the discussion items in the Go Lowell uh, multimodal plan, improved fiscal management, better traffic flow, and quality placemaking. These are all items that have been discussed in other planning efforts conducted by the city over the past 10, 15 years. Next slide, please. Another goal of ours was to adjust parking pricing to better de manage demand and system costs. I do want to emphasize one of the key goals of this study is to create a more user-friendly system. And a more user-friendly system is one that ensures space availability and reduces the amount of time that you spend looking for parking. This graphic on the bottom right on the bottom here shows a uh, an ideal utilization rate, as we call it. Um, where parking is being utilized quite well, but there's always a space available on streets. This type of system can better reflect management and operational costs, as well as manage on-street resources. Next slide. Reducing parking congestion and promoting parking availability. Similar to that last slide, we want to advertise available parking, prevent Cruising, which is when you circle the block one, two, three times to look for a parking space. And creating a park once environment where you don't need to move your car to take care of your needs when you visit downtown or a neighborhood business district. Next slide. Incentivizing greater use of the city's parking garages. We're hoping to keep the garages fully utilized sharing spare capacity with other downtown users where that exists in parking garages, and make downtown parking more attractive through use of these facilities. Next slide. 
streamlining the city's residential parking programs. Um, quite a bit of the content tonight will deal with this goal. Uh, initiatives in this goal area include addressing sign clutter, encouraging space turnover on residential streets, reducing the potential for disputes, and protecting residential parking. And next slide. Our last goal for this effort was to determine future parking needs to support growth in downtown. So this means anticipating where parking may be scarce, expanding parking capacity in a smart way, and using existing parking availability to entice growth. We'll have a set of slides a little bit later that uh, discusses how we model future demand against existing parking. Next slide. This is our study schedule. Uh, we're nearing the end of this effort. A lot of our data collection occurred in the fall and early winter of 2021. We've been evaluating parking operations the last few months. Public and stakeholder outreach efforts. This is the second round of public and stakeholder outreach. We had community meetings back in the winter. And of course, we're having this meeting right now. And we're in the middle of preparing draft and final parking plans for public review. Next slide. This slide summarizes our stakeholder outreach efforts to date. As discussed earlier, we conducted a virtual community meeting back on February 2nd, as, war, as well as four virtual neighborhood meetings uh, over the course of February. We had our public outreach survey open uh, between November and the end of February of this past year. And more recently, we've been conducting key stakeholder meetings with city staff, uh, the development community, as well as stakeholders such as UMass Lowell to share some preliminary findings. Next slide. We do want to spend a moment to summarize some of the feedback that we received at neighborhood meetings as well as through the survey. So some of our key findings that we heard from our neighborhood meetings was first that there is a need to increase parking enforcement in both residential areas and downtown. That the residential parking permit program as it exists today is problematic. Attendees questioned the need for the green and white placard signs. Attendees would like to extend the two hour limit for on street meters and kiosks. And that meters and kiosks need to be consistently maintained. Next slide. We'd like to review two of the survey questions and some of the findings from that. This first survey question asked, what influences where you park when you visit downtown? You can see from the findings here, the dark blue indicate that these factors are important, whereas the light blue indicates that they are not important. You read it from left to right. The two most significant factors were proximity to destination, as well as safety and security. Other factors that were asked that were identified as being less influential included price to park, time limits, weather, and the type of parking, such as on street parking, garage parking, et cetera. Next slide, please. Thanks. Another question that we asked was how difficult it is to find an on-street parking spot in your neighborhood. We'll sit with the slide for just a second. I'll alert you that the responses in blue indicated that um, respondents had an off-street space, such as a driveway, and didn't park on-street, or that they always found a space where they wanted it. Whereas the, res the responses in orange and red indicated that Sometimes respondents were able to find the space within a two-minute walk, but not always. For 
that respondents were usually unable to park within a two minute walk of their home. So you can see some of the neighborhood results here. We note that close to half of residents have greater difficulty finding a place to park in neighborhoods like Acre, Back Central, and Downtown. Next slide, please. So these next few slides will review some of the key findings of this effort. Next slide, please. So key findings, and we'll go through each of these in a little more detail. But first, we do want to acknowledge that parking is nearing capacity at certain times in different locations. So this includes several on-street corridors in downtown, as well as the early Downs and Leo Roy garages. Let me note that our data collection was focused on the weekday midday peak, roughly around 12 p.m. This is traditionally when parking systems are at their highest uh, utilization and use. But we also want to acknowledge that overnight parking in some residential neighborhoods is also at capacity. This was a key piece of feedback that we heard back in February. Our next key finding was that in contrast to that first statement that several locations do have capacity throughout the day. So this includes the AOT, Lower Locks, and the Hamilton Canal Innovation District garage. It also includes most, munici most municipal lots in neighborhoods and many residential streets at midday. A little bit less so near UMass Lowell, but we're still observing capacity on those streets through our data. Another key finding is that pricing today does not reflect observed demand. And that finally, the reserved parking sign program is inefficient and difficult to enforce. Next slide, please. So our first finding, specifically touching on downtown parking, we note that midday downtown parking is well utilized in some places, but not others. So this map on the right-hand side here, it's a heat map. The colors in light blue trending towards darker blue and purple indicate where there is um, extra capacity on streets or in public or private lots. Whereas the greens, the oranges, and the reds indicate where they're uh, where approaching capacity at some of these facilities. If you remember from the earlier slide, an 85 or even a 90% uh, capacity for on and off street facilities is typically a key goal of parking systems. This indicates that there is capacity on streets or in facilities, but it's being utilized at a good rate. So specifically in downtown Lowell's case, the early garage has a 91% midday garage utilization and both the Downs and the Leo Roy facilities have an 80% utilization. This indicates that these, facility, these facilities are operating near capacity. The AOC garage has a 51% utilization and Lower Locks has a 19% utilization, indicating more capacity in these facilities. We don't have reliable data for the Hamilton Canal Innovation District garage as it just opened, but anecdotally, we can report that there is capacity in this garage as well. Metered spaces on street feature the 73% utilization and off-street surface lots featured a 51% utilization. So this translates to uh, busy corridors, especially along Merrimack, Middle and Market Street but some capacity, especially south of the Hamilton Canal and outside of the early garage. Next slide, please. This is the same data, but reflecting overnight conditions. 
So we're noting that there is excess capacity for overnight parking. We'll note that this data should be, sorry. So we'll note that this is an estimate of um, from cell phone data. So we will caveat that the reliability of this data is as good as we can get. But obviously, over the past year, uh, we were not able to come out and collect uh, reliable counts given the travel impacts with COVID. But our numbers do suggest that the early and Leo Roy garages are certainly hosting a fair degree of parkers in the overnight condition. 53% for early, 44% for downs, and 40% for Leo Roy, whereas the AI and lower locks facilities are at 5 and 3%, respectively. And that on street metered and off street surface utilization is quite low 1% for metered parking and 6% for off street surface utilization, which reflects capacity throughout the system. Next slide, please. We also wanna note that parking demand differs across neighborhoods. So this is um, a heat map of the Acre neighborhood. It reflects a midday condition when UMass Lowell was in session. Uh, I believe these, uh, this data was from April, 2018. So you can see that lots at UMass Lowell are busy, that streets are busier closer to UMass Lowell, and that off-street lots are busier than on-street parking. But there is still some capacity on residential streets in Acre during the midday uh, peak period. Next slide, please. Again, relying on our estimates from cell phone data. Um, this is a map showing overnight parking utilization in Centralville. And you can see that, and this reflects what we heard at some of our meetings, um, on-street parking is difficult to find in a neighborhood like Centralville during the overnight condition. Having full streets during overnight hours, but you can see some of the off-street lots in the map to the right show as empty during the overnight hour. Excuse me. Next slide, please. So parking price does not reflect demand. So today, pricing across the community is a consistent $1.50 an hour, whether you're in a public garage or in a metered space. And pricing does not differ by location, by time of day, and by day of week. So this indicates that whether the block is busy or whether the block is empty or has a lot of capacity on it, we're still charging the same amount to park in these two phases. Next slide, please. And finally, we'll note that the reserved parking sign program is inefficient. So the reserved parking sign program, this is perhaps better known as the green and white signs and placards that you see on fences, on properties that you see in front of houses. Use of these signs is effectively privatizing a public resource, that space in front of somebody's house. Um, it leads to space underutilization. So when the holder of that sign is away, that space can't be utilized by another motorist. Sign clutter, also identified as an issue. But also this program has a burdensome administrative costs and it's very difficult to enforce. And that is feedback both from city staff as well as from neighborhood residents. Next slide, please. This is a heat map that shows where these green and white placard signs are present in the community. 
you can see that there is a concentration of it in many neighborhoods, including Centerville, Acre, Lower Highlands, Lower Belvedere, and parts of Sacred Heart. And we want to highlight a couple of instances. These are just examples of how prevalent these signs are. In Acre, at the intersection of Barney Street and Mount Washington Street, the orange dots that you see in the graphic are where signs are posted. And in this instance, 41% of the spaces on the street are reserved by residential signs. So that indicates that about 60% of those spaces, or I should say, 40% of those spaces are not accessible um, to most motorists um, in that neighborhood, unless you happen to have one of those signs. Similarly, in Lower Belvedere, the Pleasant Street, Sherman Street, and Rogers Street corridors, in this case, 35% of on-street spaces are reserved by these residential signs. Next slide, please. So we'll spend a little bit of time on draft recommendations. Next slide. So the preliminary recommendations for this study, on the left-hand side here, we have our findings, and on the right-hand side, we have our recommendation. We'll be walking through each of these in more detail. Our first finding and recommendation set is that at all times, there is extra parking capacity in the system. We should clarify for downtown. And that the recommendation is to create a shared parking district in downtown. So this involves improving and promoting public garages as a resource to accommodate private parking and changing regulations to allow for more sharing of private parking. Our next recommendation concerns how pricing does not reflect the observed demand. And the recommendation being to institute a performance-based pricing system that aims to achieve that goal of 85% utilization on all blocks and can remove time limits where appropriate in the community. Next finding, overnight parking spaces is limited in some neighborhoods. And our recommendation is to facilitate shared parking in private lots and expand the nighttime residential supply. And private lot operators can do this in exchange for city services. And finally, that residential permit programs are inefficient with the recommendation to, be to create new permit options which protect residential parking assets and provide flexibility. This includes raising the price for front door space reservations, such as those placards, but also expanding benefits for residents through permit programs. Next slide, please. So our first recommendation is to create a shared parking district in downtown. A shared parking district can promote more shared parking, attract new customers, increase options and amenities for customers. This recommendation would ensure that the city's investment and its public garages are not wasted. It creates revenue for underutilized private lots, supports infill development, especially since construction of new parking may be substituted. Uh, reduces development costs under that same metric. And also allows for the repurposing of on-street spaces for things like outdoor dining, uh, to create pedestrian space, or to implement bike lanes, transit lanes, um, effectively repurposes the space for another use that might be uh, uh, better than parking. Next slide, please. So the goal with this recommendation is to use all parking in downtown to serve new developments. So at present, um, excuse me, sorry. At present, um, there's about 5,100 um, vehicles observed during the peak in downtown compared to a parking supply of about 10,000 spaces. However, if there weren't any shared parking in downtown today, for instance, 
if the garages didn't operate as a garage and you know somebody couldn't park there for two hours and then somebody else couldn't take that space for another two hours, uh, the demand for unique parking spaces in downtown would be closer to 13,000 spaces. So effectively, as a shared parking district, downtown already is doing this today. And there's actually capacity for uh, about 4,200 spaces um, that are currently empty that could be used to attract new developments. Next slide. So this chart and this graphic, it communicates the potential future demand if we were to add nearly 7,000 additional housing units to get to downtown. You can see the housing is reflected in this orange data here. You can see that housing is traditionally used more so during the evening and early morning hours as people are home. And if we bump the usage rates for housing, you can see that we can use a lot of this excess capacity, but still reserve a bit of, uh, a bit of extra parking for comfort and safety um, even if we're doing something like adding 7,000 housing units to downtown. Next slide, please. This is the same exercise, but using commercial growth. So this represents a growth of 1.2 million square feet of commercial development. A lot of these impacts, whether it is the restaurant reflected in the red, the retail reflected in the pink, or office growth reflected in the purple is present um, over the course of the day. But you can see, even with this additional growth, we're still not hitting the uh, existing parking supply in downtown. So this is a really key part of our recommendation for a shared parking district. Today, there is capacity in downtown Lowell to accommodate new housing growth, new commercial growth without constructing new parking and to achieve some of the goals of the study, such as lowering development costs and reducing the growth of the parking supply, a shared parking district would help achieve that. We would also want to emphasize that this potential is unlikely to happen anytime soon um, because downtown just simply has capacity for the housing and commerce. Next slide, please. So at this point, uh, we do want to take a pause and see if there are any technical questions in the chat about this recommendation or about other relevant uh, recommendations. Um, we will be holding comments and feedback about recommendations into the question and answer section of the meeting. Um, Reagan or Jason, are there any questions in the chat that would be best to address right now? I don't see anything about uh, technical questions about shared parking. There are some comments that we will get to during Q&A though, Michael. Okay. So we do want to get some preliminary feedback regarding this and our other recommendations. So we do have a poll that we would like to launch. Amanda, if, if you don't mind launching. And we're asking you if you could share how much you agree or disagree with the, with the recommendation to create a shared parking district in downtown. We're asking strongly agree, agreeing, neutral, maybe not sure, disagree, or strongly disagree. Let's show the results. Mike, I think we should leave it open just for a few more moments. Okay. People are still answering. I think we can show now. So we had respondents um, really across the board, but our most responded um, answers were agree or a neutral feeling about this recommendation with some strongly agrees and some disagrees. So I'll stop sharing results and remove, and sorry, move on to the next slide. So 
So the next recommendation is to institute performance-based pricing. So this involves removing time limits and adjusting pricing in response to demand. And this allows drivers to find parking more easily and choose to pay less and walk if they so desire. So the graphic on the right-hand side here is meant to be a simple representation of what a performance-based system could look like, where uh, price uh, parking options are priced differently by location, uh, tailored to the time of day or day of the week, set to guarantee parking availability. Um, we feel in this instance, that would mean that most meter rates would actually drop but that in high demand locations, meter rates may go up. These rates would be adjusted periodically to ensure the right price is charged. And finally, we could also facilitate through this recommendation, a free period of 15 or 30 minutes. It's traditionally difficult to enforce parking at that you know, short of a time period. And this can be marketed as a way to um, ease residents and users into the system. But we've re-emphasized this 85% graphic on the screen here as a performance-based goal for the community. Next slide. So we'll pause once again for um, a poll question regarding uh, respondents' feelings about this recommendation unless we have any technical questions which can be addressed. I'll leave this open for another moment. And why don't we show the results? So we had 10 folks indicate that they strongly agree with this recommendation, and another six that they agree. Seven felt neutral, and three disagree. Thanks. Next slide, please. Our third recommendation is to unlock underutilized parking in neighborhoods. So this would provide opportunities for the city and private property owners to relieve neighborhood parking stresses. So shared parking agreements would make use of underutilized parking in neighborhoods and could be shared at all times, certain times, by permit only, during snow emergencies. There's many options that could be pursued under this strategy. And it is an opportunity for new revenue for private lot owners. This might not always be private lot owners that are involved in this recommendation. It could also be use of municipal lots. Next slide, please. So in practice, Shared parking agreements for residential use in public and private lots would be facilitated through the city, it would not be facilitated through individual users of lots, and would be provided as a perk of a residential permit system. And that protections would ensure that regulations are clear, enforcement is transparent, transparent, and private operators do not bear unforeseen costs. Next slide, please. So unless we have technical questions that we can address, um, we could launch a poll for this third recommendation. And we also acknowledge that the pace at which we're running through this presentation, technical questions might come in after we've moved on. Um, please feel free to continue to chat and type those and, and we can get to it at the conclusion.
So why don't we report out the results? Our highest response here was agree, 10 responses. We had eight responses that felt neutral, five which strongly agreed, and two which disagreed. Let's move on to our last recommendation. And this involves redefining residential parking options. And our goal here is to um, design attractive permit options which make neighborhood parking work better. So this slide discusses how residential permit options work today. There are two permit options in the city at present. There are the green and white reserved parking signs and placards, as, as well as residential parking stickers in neighborhoods like Pawtucket Hill and Acre. So the reserved parking signs and placards, they can be used only by one vehicle per household, as there's only one space that can be used. It allows for parking in front of a house. At present, there aren't other benefits that derive from this program and that the price is pretty inexpensive, just a few cents a week, $10 a year. The residential parking sticker is a little more, um, allows for a little more privileges with it. So it can be used by any vehicle in the household since it's tied to the vehicle and not to the property. It allows for parking on the whole street but similar to the signs and the placards, at present, there aren't any other benefits to this program. And the price is nothing. Next slide, please. So potentially in a future condition, uh, attractive permit options could include what we're terming as a master permit and a super permit. So a master permit could be thought of as the sort of evolution of the placards, or as the super permit would be an evolution of the sticker program on a more citywide basis rather than limited to certain neighborhoods. So to discuss the master permit, similar to the placards, um, it can be used by any vehicle in the household, but there would be the ability to charge and assign more um, permits for more vehicles and households at a surcharge. However, this would still um, not address the issue that it is only for one space in front of the house. So you might have a, multiple vehicles in the household competing for that parking space. But that is a benefit of it. You still are able to park in front of your house. We wouldn't assign any other benefits in this idea of a master permit, and the price would rise. Parking in front of your house is quite the privilege, <laughs> um, and the cost to administer this type of program would need to rise to, um, uh, sorry, the price to uh, uh, administer the program would need to rise to meet the costs, but there would be a period of transition for existing users. The other option that we're proposing is a super permit. So like the sticker program, it could be used by any vehicle in the household. But instead of allowing for parking on the street, it would allow for um, privileges throughout the city. So this could mean additional time at existing time limited spaces. It could mean discounts for metered parking or garage parking. It's also proposed to be inexpensive, kind of similar to what the green and white placard signs cost today, really just to cover the cost of administration. So again, our goals with these ideas was to transition the permit program as it currently exists from something that works for some people, but we understand doesn't work for many others to new options, which hopefully provide more flexibility for users and better reflect the costs of administering those programs, as well as address enforcement. 
Next slide, please. So the idea is that the cost of these programs isn't something that is just taken by the city and, and goes somewhere else. Um, the idea is that revenues would be split between neighborhood investment and operating costs of the program. So that includes program administration, but revenues from this program could be also funneled into transportation improvements in the neighborhood, as well as economic development activities, especially in neighborhood business districts. Next slide, please. So the idea of revenue sharing is particularly important um, when we're talking about visitor parking. So the idea with residential parking programs is that we would want to overlay time limits and a separate fee structure for non-residents. So this fee structure for folks who don't live on the street or might not have a master permit that allows parking throughout the city, this parking would be priced competitively with public garage parking and university parking to really limit the use of non-residential parking on these streets and protect um, sort of the need for residential parking. So it incentivizes the use of parking resources that are better meant for those types of users. And certainly with this type of system, we would need to um, look at smart payment options such as using a smartphone app um, in terms of administration. But these higher fees, again, the idea is to split these between neighborhood investments and the cost of operating the program. Next slide. So finally, with our residential permit options, we're also hoping to make monitoring and maintenance easier. So the idea is to use ambassadors and municipal staff and scale back police involvement for administration of parking uh, enforcement. Again, with many of these recommendations, it is a suggested change in how the system works today. So a bit of a transition period and forgiveness for first time offenders, such as through ticket violations, which simply educate on policy. Um, we're looking to enforce sidewalk, sidewalk parking violations for ADA compliance. This was a key piece of feedback that we heard at many neighborhood meetings. Um, Cars parked on sidewalks certainly limit the ability of those um, who are mobility impaired around. And also in a long-term condition, um, using revenues from these programs to hopefully implement design improvements. This graphic on the right-hand side here speaks to um, potential improvements such as striping parking lanes or crosswalk and curb improvements. So we'll move on to the next slide here. And before I ask our last, our last poll question, um, I'll ask if there are any technical questions that can best be addressed right now regarding this recommendation. I think there's some questions about the past program, Michael. So yes, I see, and I apologize if I missed something. Uh, Deb asked how many passes per home per car when giving a super pass. So uh, reminding a super pass would be um, the permit option that would provide privileges throughout the city. So the idea is that this would be uh, able to be provided to anybody in a household with a vehicle. Similar to how the residential sticker program works today, you demonstrate you live in a neighborhood that has a uh, sticker signs up, you're allowed um, a sticker. And I also see that Belinda asked, would the citywide pass be available to any resident of the city, regardless of neighborhood? And yes, that would be the case. So Amanda, why don't we launch the last poll question asking for feelings about this recommendation. Mm -hmm. 
We'll give a few moments for folks. Why don't we report out the results? So we had a mix of responses to this. We had six um, respondents indicate that they strongly agree. And then eight respondents each indicate that they agree or feel neutral about this. And then three respondents disagreed and two strongly disagreed. So I'll ask that we advance to the next slide. And at this point, I believe I am handing next steps over to Chris Skeen, who want to advance to the next slide here. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so for next steps, we're going to continue to collect feedback from all of you. Um, we understand that this is just the beginning of the conversation for changes in our parking system in Lowell. Uh, and in the next month, we hope to do a similar presentation to the city council um, and then maybe Based on those conversations, again, additional conversations in specific neighborhoods with specific business organizations, districts, and neighborhood groups, um, and obviously with the blessing of the council, we may try to pilot early technology changes in permits and sharing and price discounts in small areas to see how they do and then scale as we go if there are successes and if they're not, make changes and adjust. Uh, we will continue to work on a, developing a phased implementation plan. Um, because we don't want to shock anybody with major changes all at once. And everything will be coordinated with the city council. So things that you've heard tonight, um, you know, these are not final recommendations. I just want to reiterate, this is the beginning of the conversation and we will continue to do outreach and talk to, talk to residents and talk to community groups. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this presentation will be available on the project website and we will be taking your feedback through a variety of channels. Uh, we are also taking feedback um, so through email, Facebook, and an online form. Um, and I think someone is going to put the online feedback form in the chat. It's linked here, but it, someone will link it here too. Um, so we want to hear from you. Uh, most of you probably have my email, but you can also email parkingstudy at uh, We have all of your emails, so we'll keep you apprised of future public meetings, especially in front of the city council. Please don't hesitate to reach out with questions, comments, or concerns. Um, and next slide, please. I'd like to now hand it over to Reagan, who will facilitate the question and answer portion of the program. Thanks, Christine. Um, so now is your time to uh, comment and ask questions, although I know that Jason's been answering some in the chat already, which is great. Um, and we will also answer some of the questions that remain in the chat from uh, over the course of the meeting. Next slide, please. I am going to review a few technical details before we open the meeting up to verbal comments. Uh, people who wish to share a comment uh, or question verbally can press the raise hand button. When we recognize your name, you'll be unmuted and you may speak. After you share your comment, we will lower your hand and you will then be returned to the muted state. I think we had a few people joining by phone and if you are on the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star and then the number nine. If you are not commenting in English tonight, please raise your hand to provide your comments and questions verbally for the interpreters to hear and repeat back your comments. And as always, if you would like to share a written comment or ask a question, you can also use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. We're going to alternate between reading questions and comments already submitted and recognizing those who want to pose a question verbally. And we'll ask you to be brief so we can hear from as many people as possible. So before I open it up to the general public, um, are there any elected officials in attendance or their staff who would like to make comments tonight? You can use the raise hand feature. Okay, not seeing any. Um, I think we'll go to, and I don't actually see anyone with their hand raised. So any member of the public who would like to make a verbal comment can raise their hand now, but we can also, um, go through the chat and uh, ask some of the other questions. So Amelia, can you go to the next slide, please? Wonderful. Um, so I think there was an early question, I'm gonna go back in order, um, about it, whether or not pricing uh, will be income driven, um, especially for garage parking downtown for low income residents. 
Um, I can jump in and answer that. This is Jason. Uh, absolutely, uh, garage pricing would not be income driven and where uh, prices are set today in downtown especially. We actually don't see that there is a reason to see that those prices would increase. Um, in time, the mechanism of performance-based pricing and maybe activity in Lowell would drive utilization high enough that the garages need to have their rates increase, but that's mostly for transient parkers. If anything, performance-based pricing is intended to make remote parking even cheaper and allow downtown residents to save some money by parking a little bit further away um, and walking to their car. Thanks, Jason. Um, I see that Sally has her hand raised. Amanda, can you unmute Sally, please? Hi, um, I have two questions. When you did the downtown um, utilization, do you know how many of the, for example, Leo Roy garage spaces are, are part of an agreement with a condo? Because there are a lot of us that live in downtown that lies that. That's one question. The other question had to do with the um, other areas um, changing the permitting, and I wondered if you know, some of those houses have multiple drivers and multiple cars, and is there a pricing for each car, or is it one, you know, would, would I, I didn't quite understand how that was going to work. Um, Michael, I can address the second question uh, right away, if you remember about the past percentages, or maybe Terry does, we can answer the first question after that. Uh, but with regards to um, the, the pricing um, for remote parking, is that what your, your second question was? I'm sorry. Well, if you, you know, if you were giving someone a, a permit to park anywhere on the street or anywhere in the city from that residence, there could be three, four, five drivers, there could be multiple right. cars, you know, are you giving, is that the same as somebody who has one car and one drive? I, I just didn't understand how that worked. So right now we're recommending that everybody who is able to get a resident permit today would continue to be able to get this super permit tomorrow. So if today, there's multiple cars in a household and they can get multiple permits to park on their street, that would continue. There are, as the program evolves, examples of other communities in the Commonwealth where they do limit the number of permits per household. Um, they usually will do that to one per unit or several per building. Right now, there's no recommendation to do that. But as the program evolves, if it's popular, that may need to be something that is uh, put into place. Um, many folks may have read in the Boston Globe, there are households who had seven or more uh, permits for their resident parking program, and that can become a problem um, over time. But right now we're not recommending changes to the quantity that households could obtain. And Sally, to address your first question, yes, we are in uh, possession and we, we understand the kind of magnitude of lease agreements um, between the parking department today and residential projects or um, office uses or retail uses throughout downtown. Um, and certainly for that about the Leoroy facility um, at our community meeting back in February about um, folks using that in the overnight hour. Our shared parking recommendation accounts for the agreements that are currently in place today and notes that it can be more formalized and expanded upon. And it's probably worth mentioning that the parking department's current practice of being so open about entering into lease agreements with um, developers, with um, employers and tenants is rather unique among um, 
booking operators in this area as well as throughout the country. Um, this is a recommendation that most parking departments and authorities across the country uh, would be best served to think about, and Lowell today is doing it. Um, and our recommendation with a more shared parking district is to better formalize it and better fold in some of the private parking resources today. So, you know, a surface lot that serves an office project could potentially be used for residential parking in the overnight, maybe not um, in your instance, but with another project in the downtown area. Um, without getting into specifics about it, um, you know, we're looking to kind of expand and more formalize the program that currently exists today. Thank you both, uh, and thank you, Sally. So I'm going to, uh, I know Dennis has uh, his hand up. So uh, Amanda, can you unmute Dennis for us, please? Hello, um, <clears throat> I'm a member of the zoning board. And so parking always seems to come up on projects that we have coming for us, um, as well as I'm a landlord that owns a few rental properties in uh, the sites that you noted as um, having problems with on-street parking. Um, and I was first thinking about the apps that are available in Boston to find a spot. Um, and so I don't know if there's any um, systems in place for, you know, Park Lowell or Spot or Veer or Superhero kind of things that would help us as Lowell residents find on-street parking that's available so that we don't circle the, the block seven times and we just go where we want to go or we reserve the spot that we're looking for in the garage before we arrive for the dinner and the theater show that we're looking for. Um, and then the second one was, uh, second question I had was about this sharing of parking for snow emergencies. So as a person that owns rental property, on-street parking obviously disappears in snow emergencies. So the idea of having those residents have to go to a garage and then have to walk to their um, residences, which might not be around the block from the garage, which most cases aren't, uh, is it possible to have these smaller restaurants or smaller um, shops that might have empty parking lots at night do some parking sharing? for residents during snow emergencies. So those are just, I, I love this discussion because this discussion is so important to me. Um, I'm looking forward to the day that we have autonomous cars and we don't need to have these scenarios where we're talking about all these cars that don't do anything to sit on the road uh, or in the parking spaces. But in any event, until we get there, um, I'm looking for your input on these two ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I'll take the first one, Michael. You can take uh, the second one. First of all, yes, technology will come and it will make it easier to find parking. Uh, the city is beginning to implement some of the kinds of technologies that make that become possible. The pay by phone app um, has that as a type of feature. Um, not available yet, but something that when in combined with future upgrades, other equipment can happen over time. I won't speak for Terry about how soon that'll happen, but the market does demand that. And over the course of several years, you might begin to see that. For a performance-based pricing system, it's extremely valuable to have that information in advance and know that it's going to save you some money to just park here and walk ahead into downtown and know that that space is open as opposed to going into downtown and trying to find the space that is available but costs more. I can't say when that will happen, but it is something we'll include in our long-term recommendations. The second question, Michael, was about, uh, I think, a great recommendation about wow. parking for neighborhoods. Yeah, uh, discussion about snow emergencies came up quite a bit during our first outreach back in February. It's fair to say that there's quite a bit of discontent among folks in the community 
about existing kind of snow management policies. And Dennis, you're right. Most of the folks that we heard from, it's simply not practical to um, trek to and from a downtown parking garage from where they live. Our shared parking recommendation in residential neighborhoods, when we're talking about private lots, whether it's a retail store that's closed during the evenings um, or something similar to that, um, to enter into that type of agreement, there would obviously need to be some type of benefit for that private lot owner. Um, often that is some type of cost sharing for maintenance and operations. If snow emergency policies were to be expanded, that would allow residents to park closer to their homes and neighborhoods in these types of lots. The exchange would be some type of plowing with the city or some other type of benefit that makes sure that you know, these lot operators are um, being compensated for uh, you know, the, the extra cars that they're taking on, especially during a snow event. Um, we're not looking at that level of detail about what those benefits could be, but it simply is looking at providing another option for residential parking during snow emergencies that today simply doesn't exist because the capacity of municipal lots um, and really the capacity of, of the Lowell Parking Department to store vehicles is mainly concentrated in downtown. Um, so I would say that this is a bit of a to be determined how that would look, but it's something that we feel a shared parking um, policy in residential neighborhoods could really be um, of assistance with. All right, thank you both again. And thank you, Dennis. Um, I'm gonna go back to the chat for a minute. I know we have some uh, lingering questions and comments. Um, I'm going back to sort of earlier in the meeting, there was a question from Lawrence about um, providing a free shuttle to the garages to maybe make the less convenient garages have more appeal. Um, I don't know if either of you could speak to that at all, that idea. Um, yeah. Oh, oh. I, was, I was gonna say that's that's certainly a good idea. We we certainly recognize that, you know, if these facilities were in different places, there's a reason why some facilities are used heavily and others aren't. And that has to do with proximity to, you know, where you're going. So how to best um, facilitate getting to a more outlying facility and your destination is something that um, the city could be thinking of. Um, with our performance-based recommendation, the idea is really to use pricing to kind of shift that demand around. But, um, you know, any type of revenue that could be generated from um, the system, which we don't anticipate would necessarily go up because we feel rates would go down in a lot of places, but would be, uh, could potentially be invested in not just shuttles, but just, you know, improved sidewalks, accessibility, um, safer crosswalks of streets to get from some of these um, more outlying garages to um, the rest of the downtown. Thanks, Jason, um, or Michael. Uh, so there is a question that's a technical question, I think about the shared parking um, and whether or not it assumes that everyone downtown leaves during the day, like what's the margin for people who live and work downtown when you talk about shared parking? We don't assume that everybody leaves during the day. We um, um, data from a, a lot of these types of studies across the country, where you know we've uh, not fan tech, but you know residential developments have been counted to see how many cars are there, you know, during the overnight and during the middle of the day. Uh, a good barometer is about fifty percent of vehicles are still there um, throughout the day, and I would guess so for the last year, it's probably been higher given the impacts due to COVID. So the, that um, assumption is built into um, how we've estimated, um, especially parking in garages, which um, of course we weren't able to count using aerial imagery like we were for some of the street parking. Um, there was a question in the chat and I don't know if it got answered by the presentation, I'm not sure about neighborhoods that don't have parking lots. 
and sort of what their recommendations are for those neighborhoods under this proposal, I guess. I mean, I think in our data collection where we saw some of the highest um, overnight demand happening, um, conveniently there were a lot of, or a few at least lots, but not necessarily always public lots. And so part of the recommendation is if it's a private lot for the city to provide incentives um, and assurances and guarantees that their parking might be able to be used overnight for residents in that area. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are not areas that of course there is not a lot anywhere nearby and that don't maybe have difficulty finding a space overnight. Um, in those cases, uh, there's not a lot of options if you're already parking up on your streets and everybody already has a permit. Um, that is definitely a localized problem that may persist. Uh, our, our only hope is that long-term, um, you know, parking demand will continue its uh, low, long and slow trend towards uh, fewer and fewer cars over time. And maybe someday technology will save us all and robot cars can drive us, but that won't be anytime soon. <laughs> so I'll say I'm going to continue with the chat questions, although Jason is beating me to some of them. So uh, please uh, bear with me for a moment. Um, there is a question from Beth in the chat about is the city considering modifying uh, the garage pass for small businesses and their employees, the current 20 person requirement is difficult for very small businesses to manage. So I, I guess I will answer that. Uh, so it, it's, we have it set at 20 people. And it's a group rate, not necessarily a business rate. We just require a group of 20 people. They can be from multiple businesses uh, or one business. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and we just ask that those 20 people pay the parking department once a month with one check. And, and that's how we allow that program to exist at the 20 or, or more. Uh, we have in the past had a couple of groups uh, that do this. And uh, it's worked fairly well. Uh, and we, we do have groups that use it now, but all we ask is it's a group of any 20 people, uh, multiple businesses, one business, it doesn't matter. And we just ask for the one payment every month. I think in the past, it's been confused with like a small business uh, parking uh, program, but it's really a, just a group rate. And, and I think one thing that um, we've discussed with Terry is as the program evolves in the future and we start to bring in some of the specifics of what a shared district is about, um, there might be opportunities for some flexibility on that. I think as pricing is thought about across garages differently, um, you know, garages with high demand, you know, it may be tighter requirements and less permits or higher cost, but we have new garages and bigger garages with less demand right now, and there's an opportunity for more flexibility in the system. So as we start to figure out the specifics, I can certainly see that some of uh, what Terry's been doing to date out of necessity will be able to evolve. And I'll take this moment again to uh, promote the feedback form, the online feedback form that we shared the link for too, if people have suggestions or comments and feedback they wanna give, that's another avenue tonight. Um, Michael, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh, Lawrence does have a question a little bit more, for a little bit more detail about how the residential shared parking actually works. Um, his question is, how can you be sure you will have a parking spot when you get home if the spot is shared? Can you sort of just talk a little bit more conceptually about that? Sure. So the, the two options, and actually, Amelia, if you don't mind, kind of going back to that slide that lays out the options. So the, the two options, um, we would, with the master permit, it would essentially kind of retain the spirit of the green and white placard signs that say, this is a space that is obligated in front of this house. Um, 
for use by me, the holder of the master permit. Today, given that the green and white placard signs apply to anybody in the house, um, we've heard from Terry and the parking department that they receive a lot of complaints um, from residents about somebody's parked in my space. And in some instances, the person parked in that space is actually, you know, another person who lives in the house. And there's not really any rule that prevents that at present or any way of, um, of accounting for that. With this new permit option, um, the idea behind the master permit is both to transition away from the current system, but still retaining kind of that um, key benefit for the user of that current system, certainly at a trade-off of a higher cost, um, but to kind of take a little bit of the administrative burden off of Terry's team, um, actually be explicit about um, which vehicle can use that parking space in the home. So if this master permit is tied to a car rather than a household, which is what the idea is, um, that car would have the space obligation. However, we do want to be open to the idea that more than one vehicle in a household could potentially use that space. Um, for instance, if your partner um, wants to use that space as well, if you have a driveway that can fit one car, but you have two cars in the household, it's not really practical to just tie it only to one vehicle. Um, the idea is that we could potentially sell a second or even a third permit um, to members of the same household, but the trade-off there is a bit of a higher price um, to really uh, take uh, account for the fact that that does increase the potential for administrative burden for the parking department to settle some of these disputes when it's not as kind of clean of an instance as I just um, discussed, um, and really to uh, signify the cost of the benefit of being able to park in front of your home. Um, I hope that answers what you were looking for, but I'm happy to clarify if it didn't. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm going through the chat and I see there's a question about households without cars, like, and specifically if an elderly disabled person um, could get a pass for caretakers parking if the if the caretakers don't live in the city this is a this is a great question um, traditionally households have been allowed to get a visitor pass in other cities that they can put on the dashboard and that's something that Lowell I think Terry we do you do that already correct Yes, we do offer a visitor pass, uh, and typically we put the license plate number of the visitor on the pass. Uh, we can offer them for a three month or a six month or something like that before they get renewed. Uh, but we also watch to make sure that that pass isn't being used every single day and isn't there in the afternoon and early evening. It's meant purely to be a visitor. Uh, and, and which a, a home health aide would be a visitor who would come to the house two, three days a week for an hour at a time would have a spot to park. Yes, we do that at the parking department. There's another layer of this in addition to having that type of pass for visitors for, for home health aid that I think is important that we're trying to introduce with the idea of a super permit and that's pretty um, significant, I think, for Lowell, which is that instead of having streets that say resident parking only, and you know, different residents may be able to park there for um, some amount of time if it's not their neighborhood, we actually recommend that there is a regulation and then you can get out of that with the permit. So for instance, the regulation might be two hour parking except by permit. And what this means is that some other visitors can come to your house and stay for two hours or so without a placard. And it can be as little as an hour, but it allows for deliveries. It allows for friends coming in from out of town. It allows for dinner guests and other 
levels of short-term stay that often can become really a problem with an exclusive resident pass program. Our recommendation with the super permit is that over time in, in places that can handle it, where this isn't causing a problem, there's actually a regulation that says, you know, you can stay for a while, but if you have a permit, you can stay here as long as you want. Thanks, Jason. Um, I think there was some exchange in the chat um, with some clarification about if these suggestions take away resident only parking in front of your home, your own home. So I just wanna make sure that we have a clarified buttoned up response to that question. Yeah, I think I tried to answer that one quickly, but um, to clarify, we're, we're not really trying to change what exists. We're trying to incentivize something that might be better. So if you're somebody who really wants that space out in front and you've been purchasing those signs, you, you, that's not changing. Um, over time, it's the city's discretion that that cost, which is extremely low, $10 one time, I think is what I heard, um, is not even close to the administrative cost. And so over time, that might go up. But what we're trying to introduce is a new permit that also has a cost, but is ideally less than this master permit that allows greater flexibility, that allows you to park in other neighborhoods that otherwise you'd need a permit to park there, but instead you can park for as long as you want or for a certain amount of time. Gives you discounts in the downtown garages, maybe lets you stay longer than time limits in other places, um, but it doesn't involve a sign. And what that means is you'll be able to park near your home, you'll be able to park in your neighborhood, but, and ideally you park out front, but there isn't a sign reserving that space out front because that privatization of the public asset is extremely hard for the city to manage and arguably not very equitable for a, a public resource like Lowell Streets. There are only so many of them and actually Lowell does a great job of sharing that limited resource as all the data here has demonstrated tonight. And we hope to actually make that better. But we believe that the signs have come into place because not the right kinds of programs were in place and that sign came in as a stopgap. And we think that a super permit is the better way to go. It's really based on best practice from multiple communities, not only here in Massachusetts, but uh, around the United States. Thanks, Jason. I'm actually gonna ask Amelia to go to the, the final slide. Um, I think there was only one last question, which was the who would monitor all these new options and if there's like budgets attached with these uh, recommendations, so. Um, I will sort of conclude on that question and then allow Christine to do some final remarks. So monitoring. Um, I'm not gonna make Terry answer this question because Terry is like, I gotta spend time monitoring all this. We really sincerely believe that data is incredibly valuable and the ability to actually count performance of cars on the streets is actually one of the lower cost items, even of our consulting fee for the work that we've just done for the city. Um, but that said, when we start to implement a lot of the recommendations here, which include mechanisms for pricing of transit parking, which include distribution of permits, which include a more flexible form of enforcement that is based on ambassadors, it becomes easier for the city to be able to count the number of cars and monitor performance because they're much more focused on going directly to where there's a clear violation, somebody not paying for something, something that's very obvious, as opposed to trying to figure out what car belongs where and whether or not this car is entitled to be there or not. We want to make the recommendations clearer that makes enforcement easier and also, yes, 
if there is some level of monetization of the super permit, um, you know, we're still talking pennies a week, um, that's enough to be able to afford ambassadors to be on the streets a little bit more than they are now and to be able to not only monitor but enforce hopefully less regularly a better parking system in the neighborhoods. The downtown garages are easier. They've got gates and as Terry continues to upgrade equipment and there's parking information and pricing information, we can begin to know how that's working even better over time. Um, and I think that's an important takeaway of our work behind the scenes with Terry as well. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'm gonna give my apologies to Stacy, whose question I missed earlier in the chat. I'm sorry, Stacey. Um, she did ask, uh, how would handicapped spots be factored into these new program options? Yeah, and I think I had quickly answered that, but my apologies if it wasn't clear. No changes to that whatsoever. For instance, if you, know, you, you, you have a handicap sign or space that continues to stay the same way, if there's an exemption from payment, that doesn't change. We're not we're not asking to, to change any of those approaches at all. Thank you. So I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine, although I thank you all for a great discussion. Christine. Thanks, Reagan. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who participated tonight um, and sharing your thoughts and your ideas about the recommendations. Um, we encourage you to continue to share your feedback via the online forum. Uh, maybe we could drop the link again and continue to visit the project website and Facebook page. And I will make sure to alert all the neighborhood groups and meeting registrants when the this recording and the slides are available. Um, and so just thanks again. We really appreciate your input and your time. Uh, thanks a lot. Have a good night. Thank you.